Okay, so we're about to uh, begin an interview with Fawn Svagan. Uh, it is uh, December, uh, sorry, November 27, 2015. We are in St. John's, Newfoundland, and the interviewer will be William McRae. So just to begin, can you please state your full name? Full name is Alphonsus Joseph Fagan, but better known as Fonce. That's what my mother used to call me. And uh, your, your age? Uh, 59. And uh, where were you born? St. Joseph, St. Mary's Bay, Newfoundland. Okay. And uh, as a child, what did your parents do? Well, my mother started out as a teacher, and she taught for several years around the province. And uh, then when she met my father and they got married and started having kids, well, she uh, became the homemaker and she had 10 kids, nine of which survived. You know, one died as a baby. The rest of us are still around. So she was pretty busy looking after all of us. So um, no, not much room left for teaching there. My father was a bit of a jack of all trades. He started out doing things like driving a truck. They got into construction fishing for a while, um, did little bits of everything to survive for quite a few years and then for the last uh, 21 years of his career he, uh, he worked for the school in my community as a maintenance man, janitor and also a, a school bus driver. So he put in 11 hour days for 21 years in the last, uh, the last of his career. Wow. Yeah, they were pretty, pretty hard working, busy people. Especially with uh, nine kids to feed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not to mention, you know, growing your own crops and we kept animals and all yeah. that too. Oh. So. so you must have helped out a lot around the, the house as well? Yeah, I had lots of chores to do, yeah. Yeah. What, did, what were your interests or things to do as a kid? Um, well, as I mentioned, you know, lots of chores. I grew up, uh, we, uh, the St. Joseph's is what we call around the bay, uh, which is anywhere outside of the city of St. John's in Newfoundland. That's the expression, around the bay, even though you might be in a town of four or 5,000 people. But I was around the, around the bay proper. I was in a small community of about three to 400 people, maybe, maybe even less than that. I don't remember the exact numbers. But So there was uh, people, you know, they burned wood in their homes, so I had to cut wood every day. Uh, we kept animals. You had to you know, feed the animals and clean up after them, that kind of thing. Uh, even when my father was, you know, working full time with the school, we still had fishing nets out and stuff like that. Uh, a little bit on the side, so it was always the nets would have to be cleaned up. So you can imagine if you put, if you got a net say that's 300 feet long, 20 feet wide, and it's in the ocean for about a week, it starts to pick up a lot of slime and seaweed and stuff. So you have to pull that in, spread it out on the beach, let it dry, and and the way to clean it was you had a pair of gloves and you just bunched it up. And, brushed it in your hands, so there was a lot of work just cleaning a net. And it wasn't just me, I had brothers as well. So well, always lots of chores to do, um, but we did lots of, you know, lots of things for fun too. Uh, the summertime, you know, swimming in the ocean was good, fishing in the ocean, trouting in the ponds, so something else, picking berries. We always played lots of sports like road hockey, uh, uh, softball. Uh, once we got a school with a gym in it, we used to play basketball and ping pong, badminton, and things like that. So we're busy. In the winter time, we um, we do a little bit of skating on the ponds, you know, the frozen ponds, playing hockey, and uh, you know, tobogganing, that kind of thing. In general, you know, growing up, or uh, you know, in a community where it's very rural like that, there was lots of cliffs along the coast and woods to be explored. So sometimes we'd just be out yeah. exploring, wandering around. Probably did some fairly dangerous things like wandering onto pack ice when it came in. It was like an adventure to go onto pack ice, but I had a pretty close call out there once and I never never went there again. <laughs> so yeah, it was, a, it was an easy place to get yourself into trouble, you know, on cliffs and things like that, but uh, we were never bored. Yeah, no kidding. I was been in shape too, cutting, cutting wood. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was uh, a tough job. We never really had to think about, you know, going to the gym or anything yeah, like that. No it, was just, it was just uh, the natural way of life kept you moving around a yeah, lot. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, was there, um, <clears throat> early on, was there um, an interest developed for sciences or anything like that? I mean, I mean you had men mentioned exploration, but anything yeah. further? I think uh, I really discovered my interest in science with the, with the moon landing. 
Okay. And um, even before the moon landing, there was the Apollo missions where they were going around the moon. That's when I really got sparked into science and thought that that would be an interesting thing to be working at. That seemed to be the most exciting thing to me on TV was when that kind of thing came on. Huh. And uh, that pr probably sparked my interest, yeah. I mean, I don't blame you. Yeah. I, I find astrophysics and space exploration incredibly interesting. Yeah. Uh, so so what, uh, what was going to be your path when you were uh, in high school, getting close to uh, you know, university years? Yeah, well, I, I didn't quite know what I was going to do. I knew I had an interest in science, and I was reasonably good in math. And, uh, you know, the only science we had was biology in high school. You know, we learned a little bit of geography. We didn't have physics and chemistry and such. And I knew that you could go to university, and you could do teaching, and you could do accounting, and, and that you could do dentistry or medicine, something medical. But I didn't know too much about anything else. And one day, I person from Memorial University came to our school uh, to help educate high school students about what, what uh, programs were there. And that's when I first heard of engineering. And I thought, okay, well that seems pretty scientific, so I'll probably uh, go into engineering. So that's what I decided to do. But then when I got to university, uh, I had to do uh, first year physics and chemistry in order to get into engineering. And I had a really good physics teacher in first year who was a lot of fun, very enthusiastic teacher, and the, the subject matter was exactly the type of thing I was interested okay. in. So I decided not to go on into engineering, that I would focus into physics. Okay, so you did a, was it a major in physics? Yeah, I ended up doing a joint major in physics and mathematics, okay. and uh, you know, I was staying in the university residence, and <clears throat> you know, I was having a pretty good time there too. I was involved in the social situation quite a bit and in sports and all that, but but I still worked pretty hard. It wasn't like I, I could get through with no effort. I had to work hard. And uh, so I ended up getting an honors degree, uh, which you know, meant I had to work pretty hard. Um, and then I didn't quite know what I was going to do with it. I was thinking, this is interesting, and it seems like it's applicable to a lot of fields, so I could end up doing a number of things. I thought I would be ending up into something like a, some sort of research scientist somewhere. Uh, but then when I came to the end of five years of, at this pretty intense work, just to try and keep up with all the, <laughs> all the academics, I think I got a little bit burned out, you know, and I wanted to get out into the real world and do something, make some money, uh, experience something different than being in school, which I'd done mm -hmm. by then for at least 16 years straight in school. And um, I didn't realize why I, I kind of got burned out, but now I, I do, looking back on it, because uh, there, there was a number of opportunities that came along to go on and do a master's or a PhD. You know, different universities will let you know that they have programs, and I got a lot of letters about that, and I was approached by certain professors to go and do a master's and carry on, but I, I kind of lost the desire, and it has to do, now when I look back at it, back at it, it had, has to do with the way they teach. Um, in physics, you know, it starts out pretty interesting and pretty, uh, uh, pretty fun, really, uh, doing experiments and all that kind of stuff. But as you get more advanced, advanced in it, here's the way the class works. You come in, you sit in the classroom, and a professor comes in, takes a piece of chalk, and starts writing on the board, mostly with his or her back to you. It's mostly men, so we'll say his. And they're talking, you know, while they're writing the equations. And you're sitting there writing as fast as you can, and this stuff is all pretty much new to you, and it's pretty advanced, and it's a little bit hard to follow along. And so you're missing a lot of the concepts, and in, at the end of the day, you get as much as you can, and you, then you try and figure out what's going to be on the exam. And then you work like crazy to cover off what's going to be on the exam so you can solve the types of problems that you're going to be asked to do. So that's a pretty exhausting way to be learning. And now, if I was if I was doing it, here's what I would do. 
and I would recommend it to anybody who's going into the field. Just hand out the notes with all the equations on them. Go in and project those equations onto the, onto the board and spend your time explaining what the heck they mean. How, the, how they came about to exist, uh, what is the, you know, their historical development and all of that, how they're applicable to the world, why it's important that you should be understanding this, and then just work through it and explain that as you go. And it, it would be fascinating. And don't do it just once, because now at the time you've saved from writing stuff on the board for 45 mm -hmm. minutes, you've got time to go back over it and review it a little bit, and maybe even have some a little back and forth question and answer. That way people would remain fascinated and they'd learn a lot more. Now you still, at the end of the day, you have to understand the equations. I'm not saying for a second that, that you can remove the math from it, but it's just done very, very inefficiently. I, yeah, I completely uh, see what you mean. Deja yeah. vu to engineering school all over again. Yeah, yeah you've yeah. probably experienced the same thing. For sure. So I'm really glad today to see that there are, uh, you know, there are online education forums. Uh, the Khan Academy is one that I've looked at, where a really excellent format for the way they teach things. And uh, hopefully, the establishment is going to start to learn from this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so you wanted to, so you 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 graduated. You you did your bachelor's. <coughs> you wanted yeah. to try something in the real world. Yeah. So what was what would you consider to be your first uh, official job? My first official job, you mean post graduation? Yeah, or when or, I was a kid. Uh, yeah, like post graduation. Yeah. Okay. And how did you get it? Yeah, I uh, I started you know looking at some of the interviews that were being made available, and and one of them was with an oil company called Amoco, and some of my friends had gone to work for Amoco as geophysicists, and they all seemed to be pretty happy. With their with their new lives, uh, they'd done physics like myself. There, there wasn't really an established geophysics program at that time, so the companies were hiring mathematicians, engineers, physics students, and training them into geophysics. Um, now, of course, there are excellent geophysics programs here at Memorial and across the country, but they weren't as established. And I think there were a few courses. So anyway, I, I, I had a couple of opportunities, and uh, but this interview with the oil company uh, seemed to be the best opportunity that I had. I hadn't really given a lot of thought that I'd end up working for an oil company, but I said, well, I really don't know any geophysics. And they said, well, the fellow interviewed me, his name is Norm Pullen, great fellow. He said, well, um, you know, we can teach you the, the geo part. You know, if you know the math and the physics, we have a very good training center. We're going to send you, and plus there's lots of on-the-job training, and uh, yeah, you'll probably like it. So I said, yeah, it sounds interesting. That's how I got into it. And what was your first uh, position? Well, you start out as what they call a junior geophysicist. Okay. And uh, the, the first thing that happened when I went there was that you sat, went in, sat at your desk, and they gave you uh, a bunch of thick ring binder manuals to just start looking through and see what you could pick up on your own yeah. about seismic exploration and, and uh, seismic processing. There was certainly a lot on seismic processing and stuff and that was okay for a couple of weeks and uh, then I was given uh, a little, I wouldn't say a little, <laughs> it was a big mapping project. So the way in geophysics and type of geophysics I was doing works is you're interpreting seismic data and you're using that data to make maps of what's going on underneath the ground various layers you can map them with the sort of ultrasound method uh, same sort of physics as an ultrasound uh, but you're doing maps over it could be tens of square kilometers or it could be over a hundred square kilometers depending on how big just how big the, the project here is uh, the project is that you're working on and so I was assigned a uh, a project to just start mapping this huge project and it was going to take about six months. After about three months I was getting really really bored with it and because there was no end to it and I'm thinking okay I'm not really learning a lot this is becoming very mechanical and um, I'm starting to second guess why, why I had taken this job but then for whatever reason I got taken off that job and I was given to a different supervisor 
And this turned out to be one of my great mentors, as it turns out, the supervisor that I had, second fellow. And his name was Jimmy Hodgson. He was a little Scotsman, full of energy, full of personality. He used to spend these weekends, you know, walking through the mountains in Alberta, and it was no stopping this guy. But anyway, he, he took a look at me, and he could see what I knew and what I didn't know, didn't know. And um, he just gave me a little project, a mapping project, that was going to take me about two or three days. And then when it was done, he was able to critique what I'd done, and then I had to present my results to another supervisor. And it was part of a real job, so a, a real project, I should say. So then I presented it to the actual decision makers as part of the team. I was you know, a little, a little five-minute piece at the end. And I thought, okay, now, I, now I'm getting a feel for this. Yeah. And then that same guy, he um, gave me a slightly bigger job. You know, maybe it took me a week or two. And within, I'd say, five or six months of this, I was really enthused about the work. And I was, I could see, you know, as soon as I saw a job, how long it was going to take to do it, what needed to be done, and I was excited about it. And you were a lot more excited about a three to six month project if it came out. Well, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I don't mind taking on a, a big job when I know what has to be done, mm -hmm. and maybe I've got some people working for me by then and everything else. But, but to take a, a young person who doesn't know anything and just give them this mechanical job that they're going to have to do for six months, that, that's sort of soul-destroying. Yeah. So people, people should be very aware of that. If you've got young people coming in, they're full of piss and vinegar, as they say, full of enthusiasm. Don't give them something so overwhelming and yeah. boring that spirits. you're going to crush their spirit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, <clears throat> so you worked. how long did you work for, for Amico? I worked there for five years. Okay. And... Um, I was quite enjoying it, but I was also a little bit homesick about Newfoundland. You know, my friends were here, and I was used to the culture where, here. And where was this job you took? I was in Alberta, oh, okay. Calgary. Yeah. And that, you know, being that being the center for the oil industry, it still is in this country. Um, and so, no, that they were a great company, and I have nothing but positive things to say. You know. Uh, and were there any? I uh, learned a lot there, and I made a lot of good friends there. Would you consider to have worked on any like major, major projects, major findings? Uh, I I wasn't involved in any make, making any major discoveries. Uh, I was working in well-established areas. We had as part of a team. Always, if I mm -hmm. say I, it should yeah. really be we. I was working with geologists and engineers and landmen. As they're called landmen, even though probably a good number of them are women. Um, so uh, my role, of course, was interpreting the seismic and tying it in with the work the other people were doing. And uh, a lot of the work I did was in northeast Alberta, which was very well established uh, as an area where you could find gas. And it was pretty easy to find gas there. You know, you could look at seismic data and we could see what were called bright spots. And I think our success rate was up around 80% there, you know, finding small little gas fields here and there, little pockets of gas in proven areas. And the other kind of things we were looking for were, were reefs, like coral reefs that are you know, buried in the ground maybe a couple of thousand meters. So, you know, 300 million years ago, that was actually in the ocean, but it's now under mm -hmm. thousands of meters of sediment. Um, and these things are very, very subtle on the seismic data. So there was a huge amount of effort that went into refining the processing of the seismic data. You weren't looking for big, gigantic, mountainous structures like you might see in the offshore here. All the easy stuff had been found. It's the very subtle stuff you were looking for. Uh, but uh, but you, you also knew where not to be drilling, so we tended to have a pretty good success rate there. But no, I, I wasn't a, a part of any big discoveries like Hibernia or you know, some of the newer ones in Alberta. You know, the bigger ones in Alberta mostly happened back in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. yeah. And every now and then you find something new today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, forgive my ignorance, but uh, reefs, finding reefs, what, does, um, what exactly do you get from a reef? Well, when you're looking for oil and gas, mm -hmm. oil and gas, especially in a basin like Alberta, you know, it's present pretty much everywhere. So what you're looking for are places where there's good porosity, okay. permeability, lots of little holes in the rock that something mm -hmm. can flow out of. And so if, if oil and gas or 
and or gas accumulate in those situations and you drill into them, you get a good flow rate. Today people are drilling into rocks that don't have that good porosity and permeability and they're still getting a good flow rate by doing what's called fracking or creating fractures in the rocks. We weren't doing that, we were trying to find you know, good pre-existing porosity. So you can imagine a reef that's made out of corals, mm -hmm. it's going to be have lots of little holes in it and it can hold a lot of water <coughs> gas. And some of the best fields in Alberta are okay. reefs, actually. So naturally, find, the odds are finding a reef would have a, a lot of, of uh, porosity. Yeah. yeah. Now, some of the reefs, of course, were emptied or full yeah. of uh, no oil and gas, they're full of water. But in other areas, if you found a reef, you were almost guaranteed that it would be productive. I mean, they, they used to sustain a lot of life, too, so odds are uh, they would yeah. contain fossil fuels. Uh, yeah, but the source rock itself uh, was a separate. Generally, the source rocks are shales. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they can be in limestones, but generally they're in shales. So the shale was kind of underneath or surrounding the reef, okay. and, and the oil then seeps into the porous zones. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, so you were saying you uh, you worked there five years, but then you you're a bit homesick. You want yeah, to I got a little homesick, here. and and things were really starting to take off here in Newfoundland around 1984. Uh, there was uh, big discoveries being made every year. There was new announcements, so things were looked like it was going to be the next North Sea. And um, so I said, oh, what the heck, you know? So I came home on vacation. I started talking to some people, and I said, yeah, there's probably going to be lots of opportunities here. And I thought, well, I kind of like it here, and I've Learned, uh, learned enough that I can probably start applying it back here, and so I made the leap of faith and came back. And uh, decided to do a semester uh, learning a little, doing some geology courses, because I still you know, had that physics degree in math, and I thought, oh, I'll fill in a few blanks for me. And uh, after doing the semester, then I, I decided to uh, uh, see what jobs are there, and had a couple of offers, and I ended up accepting one with uh, the provincial government. And uh, it was a big learning curve when I went there, because as I mentioned, I was used to looking for very subtle things on, on seismic data. And offshore here, you're looking at gigantic structures with big faults in them. It's a, it was much more a type of what we call elephant country for finding big things, and it was a different type of interpretation skill than looking for really subtle changes in the shape of a wavelet that, uh, that I was doing in Alberta. Uh, but fortunately for me, uh, the province had received reports on every big exploration project that had been done offshore, and uh, those were eventually released uh, to the public. Anyway, I was able to look at all of this information and see what everyone else thought of the various areas and learned uh, in about six months, I suppose, I'd gotten to all of that and a steep learning curve, but then I was uh, starting to function reasonably well after that. So uh, so how does that differ? Because you seem to have, even though the technique and the findings are different here than they were in Alberta, uh, your role is very similar. Well, no, the, role, the role is very different because, you know, when I'm working for an oil company, I'm actually trying to do projects where we go out, we shoot seismic data, then we interpret the data and make recommendations of to buy this piece of land or to drill on it, mostly about drilling. Uh, when I was with the province, they're of course uh, into uh, regulating the industry. And so the industry is feeding them information and they need technical people to tell them what it means so that they can't be misled. You know, if somebody says there's 500 million barrels in a field, well, they need to have some independent assessment of that, so they need to have some geophysical and geological skill in-house and engineering skill in-house. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, how long did you work for the government? Uh, I, I was there for 20 years. Okay. Yep. I, uh, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't intended to stay there for 20 years, not that there was anything wrong with the government, but you know, you, uh, you can work so long in a situation and then it's always nice to do something a little bit different after a while. But the um, industry really slowed down here after 1985. What happened was a, it was a price collapse, and then exploration pretty much went down. It went down and stayed down. It's starting to come back a bit now. 
but uh, it had gone through a really active phase in the early 80s and then it went down and stayed down. So there wasn't really a lot of opportunities in the uh, private sector. Not that I, actually I, I didn't even look to tell you the truth, but when I was working at Amico, there wasn't a month went by that you never got a phone call from somebody trying to hire you away from them. Yeah. Now, that happened maybe a few times when I was with government, but there was nothing that was attractive enough to take me away. So I, I stayed there, and um, uh, it was around 2005 that the price of oil started to go up quite a bit. You know, it had been 20 to $30 a barrel, it seemed like for 10 years or so, and then it was hitting 60 to 70 and exploration started to pick up, uh, certainly in the onshore, which was part of where we had exploration here too. And so some opportunities started to come along there, and I took one of them. It was a consulting opportunity, and uh, and I at that time I was also starting to feel like I was starting to stagnate a little bit. You know, it was time to do something different. So I took that opportunity, and uh, I kept pretty busy as a consultant for several years. Were you uh, were you a consultant with a specific company or, or uh, by yourself? It was mostly for uh, mostly for one company, uh, a company named Vulcan Minerals. They were called Vulcan Minerals, but they were involved in oil and gas. But I also did work for other companies as long as it wasn't didn't look like it was going to be any kind of conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm doing work for them and there's another company that's going to be bidding against them on some land or something, I I, I couldn't do. Consulting, I actually turned down a fair bit from others who were looking for people. But uh, you know, you've got to be careful uh, in this in this game, especially when there's just a few companies involved. It's not like there's thousands of companies that are not not competing in the same pool. Yeah. So yeah, I was mostly for that company, but other I took other on other jobs as well that that were not related to that area. It was mostly that company, and at the same time, I started. You know, I was uh, well. Actually, I was already teaching courses before then. I continued to do that. Yeah, tell me a bit about uh, about that. As um, you're kind of you train and not only consult, but you're training um, people from. Is it the private sector or? Yeah, it's uh, it's wide open. It's mostly the private okay. sector. Um, the way that came about uh, actually was while I was still working for the province, probably around you know 1999. I got invited to go and speak at a high school at a, a career fair or something like that. Kids wanted to learn a bit about the oil industry, so I put together a, about a 45 minute presentation explaining some of the different types of things the industry was doing. And um, so that kind of caught on, and next thing you know, a couple weeks later, I was asked to go to another school, and then I was asked to present to a rotary group. and. About once a month, invitations were coming to start giving this particular presentation. People were hungry for information to understand the industry because it was still it was a growing concern. Hibernia had just come on a couple of years before that, and people wanted to learn about it so that they could they could start doing business in the oil industry. And um, so it struck me that there was a market there to put together a course. So in my evenings and weekends, over the course of several months, I put together a, a full day course on it. And that was in 2001 I started offering that course. I'd teach it a few times a year. I was still working full time, but I'd take a, a annual leave day and teach a course here and there. And uh, that, that's gone on pretty steadily since then. But in the last two to three years, uh, I've sort of cut back a lot on the consulting and I've put a lot more effort into developing new educational materials. Okay. So now I've also developed a course called oil and gas for investors, so that's meant to be for people in the financial industry who they probably got people coming to them to raise money for some exploration project or something, so I wanted to say, look, here's some of the things, here's some of the questions you should be asking, okay. this is some of the technical backgrounds you'd need to be able to assess what they're saying to you. And I've also developed a course uh, called uh, Introduction to Petroleum Geology and Geophysics. And I've got a one-day, two-day, and a three-day version of that, depending on how much detail people want me to go into. And, uh, you know, expanding the materials plus expanding the markets, uh, you know, outside of the province and outside of the country as well. And you said you had, 
I was giving that talk to um, high school kids. Yeah. So, what kind of uh, content do you uh, present to the to the kids? Yeah, I was teaching them about what we call the upstream part of the industry. So, uh, the different stages you'd go through if you were an oil company. You know, the, the first thing you want to do is look at the geology to see if, if these rocks are the right kind of rocks to have oil and gas in it, and then you you go in and do some geophysical work and how do you figure out where you might want to buy land or where you might want to drill and then explain the drilling process and then explain what happens after you make a discovery, what, how do you get it onto production and a little bit about refining and, mm -hmm. and markets as well but mostly those, those first parts, that, that upstream part of the industry. I can't say uh, that I know many high school kids, myself included, uh, back in the day that, mm -hmm. that uh, learned anything really remotely close to uh, to that yeah yeah it was it was it seemed to be new to a lot of people when yeah. I started putting it together yeah. which uh, which leads me to this do you think there's um, I mean not just uh, petroleum but the natural resources in general um, do you think there is a disconnect between uh, the general public and the natural resources petroleum included yeah, I, I'd say yes, but I'd even generalize it way beyond that. I, I think there's a disconnect between science and engineering and the general public. Okay. And, uh, you know, you might even uh, go wider than that. You know, the other sciences, the biological sciences and medical science and such. Um, how so? How do, you, how do you explain having a well, disconnect between the sciences and because, the Because... It comes back to the way that uh, scientists communicate. You know, they they communicate with each other in a lot of jargonized language. I mean, I struggle to get through some papers, and I've spent my whole life, you know, not my whole life, but a large part of my career, uh, you know, working in geology and geophysics, and then I'll pick up a paper, and I, I struggle to get through it. And then I realized that this was really something simple. It wasn't, it wasn't difficult at all, but it's just written in this jargonized language. Uh, there's an attempt to be completely detached and it makes for complicated sentences. So there's this culture uh, that you know we, we're, we need to talk to each other and we need to sound like we know what we're talking about. We need to sound sophisticated. We need to sound scholarly. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that gets in the way of communicating effectively to the public. Now, fortunately, you have things like the Discovery Channel and uh, National Geographic Channel and things that are doing documentaries and they're putting on lots of s science on there. But even those shows, they, they'll only take it so far and they don't really breach the gap in my view, mm -hmm. uh, that really communicates really what's going on. You know, they'll th throw out some something like, um, "Well, we think there are ten dimensions," and then just leave that hanging there and go on, as if suddenly everyone should just accept that that there are ten spatial dimensions or nine spatial dimensions, whatever the case might be, and. You know all these fantastical terms, and they all sound oh wow, that sounds so exciting. Now, well, what does it really mean? Mm -hmm. And why do you think that? And how can that be? Um, I, I see these things all the time, and uh, there's no attempt to really, to really breach it, make it, make it mean something to someone who's never heard something like that before. Uh, they have people have a certain knowledge in their brains that that they gather from walking around and uh, experiencing their lives that has no connection to that whatsoever, and so it ends up just becoming a mantra or or some kind of statement that you're, you're supposed to accept because somebody said so. I think it all has to be rooted, connected together. At least I, I know that you know there's there's this mathematical gap in between but I believe that we need to put a lot more emphasis on the conceptual side of things 
and connecting the concepts to why we would think that something like that might be true. And do you think a lot of <coughs> academia and the academics don't necessarily have to talk with all their uh, very uh, jargonized terms, or do you think it's something they could yeah. easily oh, I mean, change, I, I, deformalize I, their language, I guess? I mean, I, I speak to different groups all the time, and occasionally I'm talking to, maybe it's all engineers. Sometimes I'm t talking to people, and it's mostly public relations people, or maybe they're all accountants. First thing I do is find out who am I talking to, and I try and speak their language. Mm -hmm. So yes, if I'm giving a talk at the, the university to a bunch of PhDs in geophysics, yeah, I can I can talk the talk, and I don't need to explain certain things. But if I realize that half the audience are business people, and they're here to understand what I'm talking about, I don't care if the PhDs that are there think, you know, I'm dumbing anything down or not. I think that's a terrible expression anyway. Uh, no, you're just speaking to speaking the language that people understand. So I will take the trouble and explain uh, well, what a source rock is, or, or what a reservoir rock is, or whatever. You know, I won't just throw something out there mm -hmm. and expect everybody to know what it is. So just know who you're talking to. It's like if you're talking to your kids, you speak differently than if you're talking to adults. It's exactly the same principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you start seeing it a bit more in, in um, at least I find with even the relationship between professors and your students. Mm -hmm. More now, it's uh, professors, I, I, I feel like they, they, have to, they feel less um, obliged to have to speak this very formal, mm -hmm. you know, esoteric language and mm -hmm. bring it down to the how students speak now. I don't know, you see it more and more, but... Well, I, I, hope, I hope that's a trend, but I can tell you, you know, you go on, go on Wikipedia and look up some topic that you'd never heard of before, let's say something in physics, see if you can pass the first couple yeah. of sentences <laughs> without getting frustrated and saying, this person is not talking to me. Yeah. And that's supposed to be for the public, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, uh, so there you go. And, uh, there's, there are other sources that are better than that, but... Uh, you know, I'm not going to put down Wikipedia. I, I donate to them. I think they're, it's great what they're doing. Uh, but uh, it's just that that a lot of that stuff is written by specialists, and that's the way they're talking. Yeah. Even though they're supposed <coughs> to be writing for the public, because everyone uses Wikipedia. It's not like you're writing just for the person across the hall. And yet, there it is. Mm -hmm. You know, so. <laughs> it's just all over the place. We've got, yeah. we've got a long way to go to get past that. Well, interesting answer. Thanks. Um, I guess different topic, but could be could could be seen as similar. Um, was there a part um, part of your life or one of your jobs or one of your projects even that um, sticks out as having been quite dysfunctional? Um, I would say a project and. I'd like to give a comment, but I, I don't want to talk about particular companies, but I'll, sure. I'll give you an example of uh, something I witnessed early in my career, before I even graduated, I had a student job. I mean, uh, before I get into that, I will say that in various places that I've worked, I've seen you know a group over here that was very functional, and I've seen little things that happened that was dysfunctional here, uh, and so I've seen lots of examples of it, but this, this was one that has nothing to do with... Uh, the, the more uh, my main career it was something that happened early in my career and it made an impression on me. Uh, I got a job, a uh, summer job, working on a loading dock for a fairly large company. I won't name that company either. And there were three full time employees working there, and it was me as a student to help out for the summer. Out of those three employees, there was one guy who was working his butt off all the time, up going. He, if, if there was nothing to do, he'd go find something to do. The other two were sitting in the office, mostly reading magazines and stuff like that. I mean, they, today you could pretend you were working because you could put a computer there in front of you and you could, you know, you could put on a pretense. But there was no way to hide it. They were just reading People magazine or whatever <laughs> most of the day. And so, you know, I'm, I'm new to the workforce, so I'm asking around. So, what's going on here? And they said, "Well, these guys got seniority. This place is unionized." And yeah, they got some here. They got nothing to worry about. And so I thought, well, 
something wrong with this equation. I mean, I was pretty naive at the time, but I thought, you know, I could understand uh, the necessity for unions. You've got to be able to protect uh, the worker, but uh, this side of the equation didn't seem to be getting balanced out against it. So it gave me a very negative impression of unions at that time. So I thought that that was dysfunctional and that this company, if, this, if I could take this and extrapolate it over, you know, a few thousand people working for this company, then it's probably not going to last. And sure enough, that company did not last. I heard about it a few years later. It was struggling to get by and uh, trying to win concessions back from the union and stuff. But if, if everything was had been hopping along efficiently... Like that one guy. <laughs> yeah. Then I don't think you'd run into those kinds of problems. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm all for fairness for everybody. But as soon as I see people taking advantage, that, uh, that's dysfunctional. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, next question is a it's, a, it's a broad question, but there's no wrong answer. I can repeat it if you like it. It's a, it's a mouthful. But in your opinion, are there any events, uh, people, inventions, contributions, disasters? Uh, I mean, we can think of a, a very important one uh, here, the Ocean Ranger. Um, mm -hmm. Anything whatsoever that, that you believe must be mentioned when talking about the history of the natural resources uh, in Canada. Yeah, during during my career, and I'm going to stick keep to oil and gas. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, what you know. It's what. Uh, yeah. The uh, the biggest development in my field would have been three dimensional seismic. Now, uh, seismic data, the way it works, uh, the simplest form is that you lay down a bunch of listening devices in a straight line on the ground, or if you're offshore, you're towing it in a straight line behind a boat. And it's a single line, and you set off some charges, let's say you're on land. Once again, if offshore, you'd use something called an air gun just to make a noise. You have to make a noise. And so those noises go into the ground, and the echoes come back, and you're picking it up just on a sort of single line like that. And that was most of the type of work uh, that I did uh, when I was working at Amico. It was a two-dimensional type work. And that gives you a, a slice into the ground, but... Uh, like a, a, a single slice, like a cross section. But in the meantime, when you set off those charges, you know, sounds are going out in all directions. We'd like to think that it just comes from directly underneath, but you're getting all this interference okay. from all directions, so really fuzzy makes this kind of a, a fuzzier image than it should be. So when uh, the technology started to come along where you, instead of having laying out a single line, you have a, li a big grid, and so you capture all the echoes coming from every direction, and you're able to create a three-dimensional image of the subsurface. That required a lot of computer power and uh, new algorithms and things to make it work efficiently, and uh, new equipment as well for the field to be developed. And when that became really economic to be doing at, a, at an exploration stage and it became commonplace, that really revolutionized the industry. And at the same time, everything was becoming computerized, so you start off, I started off, if I was making interpreting a seismic line, I'm going to make a map. Everything was by hand. I took a crayon and I colored the section. And I took a ruler and I measured things. And usually I had someone to uh, help me with that, to, to take all the numbers that I measured and put them on a map somehow. And then I would make a contour map. Now you sit at a computer. You've got a couple, two or three big screens there. You can do literally 50 times the work that you could do by hand with computers. And I'm sure that applies in almost every field, but mm -hmm. certainly in geophysics. That's revolutionary. The other thing is the coming of the internet around 1995. Once, once that came, you had access to all this information, uh, efficient communication uh, with your peers wherever. And plus now you've got the ability for people, whether it's an engineer or a geologist or a geophysicist, to be having a live feed right from the drill bit in the ground feeding right back to your computer. So within seconds of, you know, say, hitting a reservoir offshore, the data is coming up on the screen and they can react to it right in the office and yeah. advise what's going on. That's, that's revolutionary. Nothing like that has ever happened in history before. Yeah. And, we're, and we're really just at the beginning of it. It's really the Wild West still for, for the Internet. I mean, where else have you seen billionaires by 26 years old, things like that? Never before in history. And 
So young people come to me and say, well, what's the area to go into? I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> anything to do with the internet. If you can create yeah. something, man, and you like that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's true. But it is, it, it is um, in a way, it looks a lot like the natural resources industry in terms of, uh, it's very cyclical. Like it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's up and down a lot. Yeah, well, yeah. You'll, fi you'll find that in everything, but you know, any great innovation is still gonna be true. Where there's a lot of money somewhere. too, there's a lot of. Yeah. And, and, and some some smart kid in the basement can can create a revolution, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it's it's software. It's not all about hardware, you know. It's ideas, and they can be converted into code, and they can be worth millions very quickly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or billions, as we've seen. Billions, as you've seen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, question uh, regarding uh, women, and and that's I often ask I ask uh, everybody this question, and that's. How present or absent were women when you started working, and uh, if that's changed, and how that's changed uh, throughout mm. your career? Well, in the in geophysics and uh, I'll say geoscience here, because working with teams when I started out at Amoco, uh, there were a fair number of women there, but still it was dominated by males. Uh, percentage, I'd, I'd say maybe twenty percent women back in the day. Uh, yeah, this is back right. around 1980. Okay, well, okay. that's that's uh, more than a lot of other areas in the industry. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I could be wrong in the number, but I, it seemed to me like about one in five of the people okay. that I was dealing with were females, and uh, they weren't all necessarily geologists and geophysicists. Uh, we had a lot of technologists, and quite, I, I know quite a few of them were female, and they, you know, these were very, very important jobs that they were doing very technical jobs. And for some reason, uh, that, that seemed to be more females uh, who got into the technology side. But uh, no, I worked with uh, very accomplished women from day one, you know, certainly in the office. Uh, in the fields, very low percentages. Of course, they're on seismic crews and drill rigs, and that's probably still the case. Uh, you know, there's more of a movement towards uh, gender equity these days, and some of the companies actually have programs where they're trying to uh, increase the numbers. Uh, later in my career, well, I went back to, to do a, a master's, actually, back in 06, oh. and I would say half the class was female. So I'm guessing... And it was a master's in what? In geophysics. Wow. So uh, I, you know, I was doing geology and geophysics courses, and, and I, I would think at least Half the classes, half in the class were female, and so I'm assuming that you're getting a lot more equity in the field these days. Um, next question: We can split it into uh, what are you proudest of in life, and then we can also say uh, professionally. Yeah. Well, there's nothing that really jumps out to me like if, if I didn't live at a cure for something. <laughs> it would be an obvious thing, uh, but. Uh, I will say that throughout my career, you know, whatever skills I had, whatever knowledge I had, I I tried to bring it to bear and do the best job I could. I often got put on jobs that probably I wasn't the best person to be doing them with the skills that I had, but I uh, I went at it as best I could and tried to give uh, give the best result that I could to anyone who hired me, uh, and not only in professionally, but if I was volunteering for a group or or whatever. And uh, you know, I talked about how hard my parents worked, so I was always a hard worker. I was never, never lazy or unmotivated. Um, but uh, thinking about some, I guess it's maybe a skill that I think I've developed that that I'm proud of, and um, and that's in where I'm doing my training courses. Of course, you know, you're on the front line and. If it's not working, it's not working, and it, you're not going to be getting people signed up for your courses. So I really put a lot of effort into uh, being effective in that area. And, I, and the feedback, I, I'm always asking for feedback. You know, give out the forums, and I take it very seriously. I go through every comment. And generally, it's pretty positive. And the most important thing I ask is, was the information presented clearly and concisely? And I've, I'm thinking about 99% yeses on that one. And so that's mostly what I'm trying to accomplish. And um, I think that I'm able to do that 
partly because when I came into the industry, I didn't know much about the industry. Uh, I knew what it was like to come into an oil and gas office and know nothing about it, you know, coming from a completely different field. And I suppose, you know, you go back far enough in anyone's history, they didn't know anything about it. But I was very much aware of uh, being surrounded by people who knew a lot more about it than I did. And so that was burned into my brain, what it was like not to know. And so I still remember that very clearly. So when I'm talking to someone and I'm trying to explain it to them, I, I know, I think I can get inside their head and I know how they're feeling and how they're reacting to what I'm saying and, and what it is they need to hear for it to make sense to them. So I'm, I'm proud that I'm able to do that and be effective in that way. Thank you. And uh, last question, and that's uh, if, if you had uh, someone much younger, and you, you probably had with the students, so if you were talking to someone like a student, what, uh, what would be the one life lesson or piece of advice you, you would choose to give them regarding their future career, perhaps? Well, looking back at my own career, you know, the, uh, I, I mentioned one guy who was a, a mentor to me, uh, this guy Jimmy Hodgson. I had another really good mentor by the name of Michael Anikescu. Uh He was a, I got a geophysicist who worked for Husky for many years, and he came and was a professor here at Memorial. He's the guy who uh, talked me to going back and do the Masters. He became a very important mentor for me. And that, I think that you know, those two characters have had an uh, impact and certainly helping me in my career. So I would say find good mentors, whatever it is you're going into, you know, oil and gas, whatever it might be, find really good mentors because they're going to save you a lot of time and they might even save you a lot of frustration where you might give up on something because they'll point you in the right direction and prevent you from maybe going down some dead ends. But on top of that, and this is critically important as well, is that you know, you learn everything you can question everything that you're ever taught. I'm not taught, whatever, but your mentors and whatever, question everything you ever taught about your profession or whatever across life I would apply that, but about your profession. Because you, not only do you want to know what works, but you want to know why it works. And you also want to know, and this exists for every generation, what are simply the prejudices that are being passed down, like rules of thumb and things that probably might have made sense at some point and don't necessarily make sense anymore. So you want to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff of what you're being given. And for that, you've got to be questioning things all the time. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to add to the interview? Um, there may be, just give me a second. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> Take your time. Uh, yeah. I would say cultivate good habits. Uh, this is more of a life lesson, lesson not, not just uh, about Curator. work. Yeah. You know, cultivate good habits. They don't, good habits for health, good habits for your career, good habits for your relationships, for sustaining your friendships, your personal relationships, because these things don't nece necessarily happen automatically. And I'm talking about things like, you know, getting up at a certain time, eating a certain way, making sure you get enough exercise to keep good health, and that kind of stuff. That There's a lot of uh, natural tendencies to kind of drift away from that. It's, it's sort of given to you when you're a kid that you've got to do this and you've got to do that. But once you put on your own, you've got to steer yourself in those directions. Because if you start getting into, into bad habits, they're, they're hard to quit. Yeah. Bad right. habits die hard. Yeah. Well, thank you. All right. <laughs>